I'm going to introduce you guys in a minute, okay? Hey guys, Vanguard Tactics and myself and Mark are joined today by a special guest, aren't we, Mark? We certainly are, a very special guest. So, let me introduce you. Let's see if this comes up. There we go. So we are introduced, uh, well, we are introduced, we are joined today. With Brian, how you doing, mate? I'm doing quite well. So, Brian, how's things? Having a Thanks. good week? Yeah, it's been a pretty good week. I've been uh, rebuilding a couple armies, been playing a lot of uh, Warhammer Underworlds instead of 40k, because I can't get people to play with me right now. <laughs> oh, dear. There we go. Oh, nice. You um, Is that because you're getting too good at 40k? I'm getting a little on the competitive side. And people are starting to be like, I don't want to play against that. I don't want to play against these good lists. I'm like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Brian, or Mark, do you want to, you, you can introduce why we've got Brian on the show today. Sure. So, uh, Brian is on our mentorship course, which we've been running for about uh, about four or five months now. Mm -hmm. And when we kicked off uh, uh, Vanguard Tactics in uh, about January, uh, we decided that we'd offer some... Uh, mentoring for a select group of people around 15 people to try and make them better at the game and um brian put his hand up and said I, i'm up for some of that and then we've had the pleasure of his company in our private facebook group and various calls over the past uh, four or five months which has been fantastic so young brian would you tell the uh guys at home a little bit about yourself where you come from how you got into warhammer how long you've been playing stuff like that so I've, I'm about, uh, so I'm about 27 years old. I grew up here in the United States. I uh, was born in California, ended up here in Utah, so mostly the Western United States. I've been playing Warhammer technically since 4th edition, but only competitively since 8th edition. Cool. Um, and I've always played basically Imperium. I started with Tau, but learned pretty quickly uh, because of my opponent, or my, my really good friends, Orc Army, that they were not the gun line that I thought they would be. So I switched to Blood Angels early on, and then since then I've gotten into Skatari and Imperial Knights and, you know, just a soup of whatever I can that really guns people down. Um, in your local play group, you know, the, the guys that you play against, your friends and that sort of thing, is, are they competitive or not so much, or what sort of armies have you got? So locally we've got a lot of Knights and Imperium. There's yeah. uh, one of the big Death Watch players who actually plays a list very similar to what Steve ended up winning his GT with. Um, he's, he's also the guy that won the hobby track at LVO this last year, uh, Lou Rollins. So he plays a lot locally. We've got one of the best orc players in the United States and Rich Kilton, who I get to play basically every other Friday with. Cool. Uh, we've got a really good tournament organizer who plays Blood Angels and Ultramarines. Uh, we've got a couple of really good chaos players, guitar, yeah, uh, a couple of good Skatari players, but not not too many. I'm one of the few right now. Uh, and then Eldar, lots of flyer lists. So it's a pretty spread out meta. There's only about one GSC player, only about one Tyranids player, only about one Tau player. So I wish we got some more of that, but we I see basically everything whenever I go to tournaments. That's really cool. So um, when did you start playing competitively? Uh, you say in eight, so it would have been uh, within the last so 18 months, and I take it. Yeah, uh, I started my, I played my first RTT actually in January. So right as I was getting in uh, with Vanguard Tactics was when I played my first RTT. So that's fantastic. So um, when, when we started Vanguard Tactics, uh, you must have seen us. What was it about the, uh, uh, what Steve was offering that, you know, made you decide to go for the uh, mentorship? The main thing is that uh, when Steve started laying out his list and what he was doing, it was very clear and very easy to approach. And I could see that there was lots of growth potential from, hey, I'm just starting this out and I really want to understand how to play competitively and how to yeah. analyze my list and analyze uh, my play style and my deployment and all these things to, hey, this is being offered. Um, it seems reasonably priced and to have a, a better connected group than some of the other uh, teams that I was looking at potentially joining. That's absolutely awesome. So uh, it sounds like you've had a positive experience so far with us guys, and we've um, we've done our best to teach you all a, a bit of something. Um, Steve, much more than myself, and maybe some of the other guys, because uh, I've learned a lot from him myself. So that oh. they, uh, 
Um, I was in a sort of similar situation to you last year. I think my first ever tournament was about this time last year, actually, um, in Warhammer. So um, Steve taught me a ton about competitive play and that sort of thing. It helped me build a, a decent list. Um, so I, uh, I I went through my own very special mentorship with him. You know what I mean? And yeah. then uh, the, the uh, as I beat him last weekend, then the the apprentice has become the master. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> that's what I'm looking forward to at the uh, master class that's coming up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was with he, he helped me beat him though, so it was uh, I was I was aided in uh, by by himself. Yeah, but <laughs> okay. Uh, that's that's really really cool. So um, you enrolled in a uh, very competitive tournament recently, oh, yeah. um, and I'd love to hear a bit more about it. So yeah. uh, the Bay Open, which is, uh, I would probably say, uh, up there with the LVO as you know one of the major GTs. Um, so you decided, well, I've been playing since January. That's plenty of time. Let's get stuck right in. Let's see what we can do. Um, so how did it go for you? Uh, it went pretty well. I ended up going 4-2 and two and took 30th place. Uh, my only losses came to a couple of the other top players, Ray Ahumada, who's another tournament organizer, and uh, plays with the Frontline Gaming crew consistently. Yeah. Uh, and my other loss was to Marshall Allen, who's uh, with the Long War team, uh, who, is on, who t- ended up taking 12th on a pretty intense uh, five dreadnought ultramarine list. So, but yeah, I had, I had a very good tournament and uh, a list that was written bespoke for me and ready ready to go and actually ended up being quite well done. It so, was it did quite well. So, do you want to talk us through the list? Yeah. So, uh, the initial list that was written was the Rusty Seventeen because I've been playing a lot of Rusty Seventeen and Knights three Crusaders, and a Guillemon, uh, so that I wouldn't have to take first knight with my Housecraft knights. I could be spending my uh, Warlord traits and my relics on other things and being able to just really buff up those knights to be powerhouses and hard to deal with. Um, what I ended up taking, I, I modified the list a little bit because of the models that I had ready and painted at the time. I literally got the list changed the Sunday, the last day of registration before the BAO. <laughs> so I made made these changes right as it was going. Um, but I decided to switch the Rusty 17 from Rangers to Vanguard because I had those models ready to go. And I changed one of my Crusaders to a Warden so that I could have the Paragon Gauntlet uh, if I needed it. And I also put two indirect missile launchers on my Crusaders and the uh, Twin Cognus Auto Cannon on my uh, warden so that I could have some anti-air which ended up actually being the right call for the metagame that I played against because I had four flyers list that I went up against awesome. yeah. uh, and, and basically the concept of the list is that Bobby G gives reroll ones to all those guys doesn't he oh yeah it, it makes them move faster makes them charge farther makes them advance farther so I could just throw Landstrider on a knight get right into their army and then just be bashing away with my Gatling guns and battle cannons at long range. So you've got a battalion from the rusty equivalent. So you get yeah. five CPs there. You get six CPs from the three knights. And then if you make Bobby G your warlord, you get another three CPs. Yep. Which, which I fun, ended up doing. Which is fantastic because then you can give all of your knights, if you need to, a warlord trait and relic for, you know, six CPs essentially. Um, yeah. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the concept of the list, and because uh, did you run Crest as well? I did. I ran Crest the whole day. Yeah, Crest is obviously, as we spoke about many a times, um, just a really good way of you know going land strider. These guys can move super quick because Bobby G also increases their movement right by an inch. Mm-hmm. Yep. So straight away land strider, they're moving further. These guys hit hard in combat because they can reroll all the hits because of Crest. They're re-rolling ones in combat. Is uh, in shooting is fantastic. So, um, oh yeah, yeah. And did you enjoy using the list that we wrote you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I finished the rounds very quickly. So I like to play. Um, I used to play competitive magic, and I used to play uh, combo decks and stuff. So I like to play really quickly and spend as little mental energy on turn decisions as possible. So this was really nice to. Uh, for conservative c- conservation of action and conserving my energy throughout the day so I could really focus on 
all of my plays and my strategy and use and everything as I was going through the things and not having to worry, oh, I need to make sure I move this and remember this key strategy and make sure that this person's within range of this thing and doing all these. And it was just like, okay, I've got five models that matter. and <laughs> The rest can just kind of sit wherever I want them. Yeah. So what was your first game? Talk us through that. What was the first game you played against? So the first game I was playing against Azur Yanni. Uh, so just a, essentially an Eldar mix. There were Harlequin... Um, Sky Weavers, which are the transports that had fusion guys inside of them, a troop master, a spirit seer, uh, a squad of bikes, uh, a bunch of flyers, both the Eldar and Dark Eldar, so the Hemlocks and the Crimson Hunter Exarchs. And uh, at first blush, you know, I've had some run-ins with the with the flyers and not had as great a time because I was playing, you know, a Castellan and a Gallant rather than three shooty knights. Um, and so I deployed kind of conservatively in a frontline assault against him. So we were kind of just on the long board edges. We were at the narrow distance between us. And I was hoping that I'd go first. I ended up going first. I got the roll, and he couldn't seize on me. And I was able to knock out a lot of his uh, flyers in the early turn. Uh, so in the first turn, I was able to take down a complete flyer, uh, some of his re reavers, the Dark Eldar battle barges or whatever, and a couple of his troop choices so that he just couldn't hold as much ground later in the game. From there, what proceeded to happen is I just basically moved my knights up, kind of shooting, and taking out flyers as he tried to engage with his fusion pistols. I basically took out a Star Weaver a turn, or per night per turn for the next couple turns, and uh, eventually got to Supernova, one of my knights that killed uh, about five squads, including a Hemlock, and my Bobby G when I tried re-rolling the dice because I'd rolled a five, and obviously because I roll really hot most of the time, I roll a six the next time, killing Bobby G because he'd taken some uh, mortal wounds. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> he he stood back up without the re-roll in that phase, and he ended up killing another couple squads himself. But uh, Bobby G was that was the first time that he was a casualty, and I was the I was the. Uh, <laughs> doing some practice side yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh that was my round one um that was the first flyer list and what was he, the score that, there it was 33 to 17 to you yeah nice yep. it was quite good uh the things so i took my secondaries as big game hunter old school and recon mm -hmm. uh, i made a mistake on my recon one turn where i didn't end up focusing on it and i failed to uh kill something on the last turn and have you percent. found some of the tools that we've used on the mentorship the um obviously one of the game trackers that we use in the game analysis performance trackers have you found that useful in order for you to analyze the secondaries that you've been picking oh yeah i was actually going through today and re-looking at it in preparation for this call and noticing that there is there was only one game where i filled out all of my secondaries and uh, so I've, I've, I'm kind of thinking of how I can re-initiate and re, um, or re-initialize how I'm choosing all of my secondaries yep. so that I make sure to get all of those. Yeah, perfect, mate. Nice. So we've got some questions in the chat, but they might get answered. Uh, so if you guys have got a question for Brian, please post it in the chat. Uh, so game two, um, what was that against? So it was that was the one against Ray Ahumada. Uh, I ended up losing it 22 to 28. He was on another flyer list though, with three fire prisms, three wave, wave serpents, two spirit seers, a far seer, and then guardians and whatnot. Um, the big issue here. So my secondaries were big game hunter, engineers, and mark for death. Um, my engineers ended up getting tied up in combat because I forgot that with Graia I could walk them out because of my characters. I thought they were just locked in, but I made a mistake there and didn't allow them to score the rest of the engineers. And I almost finished off Big Game Hunter and Mark for Death, but I wasn't able to finish off his uh, Wave Serpents and Fire Prisms. Um, and Reapers, actually. He had those as well. But I, the big issue with the game was that I, had, I put my target priority on the Wave Serpents instead of the Fire uh, the fire prisms, which I should have. I could have easily taken out a fire prism and probably another half of one in the first turn because on my knights I'd taken, you know, a Headsman's Mark and uh, Blessed by the Sacrosands and the Auto Cannon Relic and the two up, or in the four up and vulnerable. So I had all the right relics and things. But I just kind of 
misdeployed, didn't have my Gryia guys up close enough to negate his, you know, Jinx and Doom, didn't oh, yeah. target his fire prisms, and so there was just kind of, it was a comedy of errors on my side, but only losing by six points and keeping the game pretty close felt really good, because we went until the last turn. Nice. Um, and, and the reason why I suppose that, that fire prism is that target priority is because they have for one CP, they can re-roll all hits and wounds, right? Yeah, with Link Fire, yeah. So yep. as soon as you bracket one, you take out another, all of a sudden they're just not packing that punch anymore uh, because yeah. they do get minimal shots. Um, yeah, so that... Yeah. And the other thing with Wave Serpents as well, a lot of your damage is only two damage. So they're going to half the damage of every single one of those shots that you put through. So really it could just be a case of waiting for those Reapers to come out. You'll take a hit from them. They'll... You know, reliably do some wounds, but they won't kill you. So turn one, you focus on the fire prisms, maybe take out two, um, wait until those dark reapers come out, um, and then essentially indirect fire them every single turn. Although they'll be firing fading and just sticking two units of Gariah in front of your knights at all times to prevent jinx. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a big mistake. And at, literally after the first turn, I realized that mistake and was like, okay, how can I fight this back? And I just had to worry about okay, I got to kill, I got to kill, kill more, hold, hold more, and just try and do that for the rest of the game. Good. And I nearly pulled it out, but uh, I, you, he was a very good opponent, and he was able to get some really lucky rolls against some of my shots and it, stop me from. And that's the thing when you play against someone that's very good. If you make a small mistake, they'll capitalize on it, right? Absolutely. Um, there's no margin for error, which is obviously why we are so diligent in our analysis of our games in. Uh, why we go over the content that we do in the mentorship just to make sure that um, you know like you said you've already repeated some things already that um, you know you just need to focus on what is it that you need to do not what you can do what do you need to do in myself and Mark had this exact same experience in our play testing on um, Sunday didn't we Mark and we'll go over to sure that into more yeah. detail I basically bullied Mark into swapping target priority from my he wanted to shoot my obliterators, didn't you, Mark? I did. And I was like, don't you do it. You need to shoot those cultists over there. Um, and he was like, what? I was like, because it's a three-point swing if you don't. And that's massive. It was. Yeah, yeah it was the, like I was saying, because uh, Steve was helping me out. I was using a new list, new army for the first time. We were proxying left, right, and center. And those obliterators, I was thought, but they're so potent, they're going to do so much damage. But one mm -hmm. unit of cultists was going to score three points, and that was the difference between winning and losing, for sure. Yeah, and, and they were just making a making a march for the end of the table, weren't they? And I, and I was yeah. kind of doing it, you know, round the corner so you could barely see them, you know, hardly even noticing them on the table because it was on the other side of the board. Um, and I was like, mate, you need to shoot your Telamon over there. Like you wouldn't normally shoot a Telamon at cultist; you'd shoot the big scary things, but. Again, they're going to score me three CPs. I'm going to get Last Strike. I'm going to get the um, um, Line Breaker with them. And they're also going to score an objective. And they're going to stop you getting the bonus objective. So that's like... Yeah, yeah I think I had an officer on that objective yeah. as well. So it would have been kill something as mm. well. So it could have been actually four points. Exactly. Massive. Um, so, yeah, not going for the obvious choice is the right one sometimes you've got to really play and get those vps mate aren't you yeah absolutely so um yeah have, game have, three yeah. yeah game three yeah okay game three so this was against another flyer list three reavers uh four of the barges that hold guys in it this it was just drukari he was he ended up being the top drukari do player mean, do you mean ravages uh, no yeah, raiders, ravagers yeah the, the ones the barges with old people are raiders Okay. They look like Ravagers. Whatever. Ravagers, yeah. are the, <laughs> Ravagers are the gunboats. They've got like. So he had, he had three of the gunboats and then four of the ones that hold guys. Okay. Cool. okay. Three Ravagers, yeah. four Raiders. This is my specialist subject. I could, yeah. I could do this on Mastermind, but it's the only <laughs> thing I I know about. To any other army, forget it. So that's why I know the names. <laughs> and then he had yeah the, um, grotesques and another one of the deep striking units that comes in and can do like mortal wounds and stuff um and he shot him at my vanguard squads and i literally had a vanguard squad make like six six up uh like 
his <laughs> yield saves against it, and, and he's just like, why? And literally, <laughs> that Vanguard, that one guy stood for the rest of the game on the objective that they tried shooting him off of. <laughs> so, uh, I ended up winning that one 30-23. to 23. My secondaries were old school, big game hunter, and marked for death on all the boats. Uh, I took his flyers out of the air pretty early, just kind of marched up the board. Had my knight go and fight his grotesques, which was nasty that combat lasted forever i eventually blew my knight up and killed the stuff <laughs> that was the way i had to finish it um this was the, one of the one of the two games that i nearly scored all of my objectives i only missed one on my old school because i couldn't kill his warlord um for some reason there was he would just had so many guys screening it that i could just never kill that warlord and uh yeah we i pretty much played spearhead assault so I played Spearhead Assault in these last two, and I played that like pretty much the entire tournament, except one Vanguard Strike, one Frontline Assault, and then the rest, the other four, were all Spearhead Assault. Um, so I played a lot of longboard edges, which with Knights is kind of annoying because you want to get them up and you want to get them close, but your opponent is going to counter-deploy you every time. Nice. Uh, but I also, so I went first that game. I went first almost every game except my fifth game against the Ultramarines. So but, game four then. Yep, this was against Necron, so uh, day one had finished. I played against pretty much all Eldari, and I was So at this point, you go. were two wins and a loss, right? Two wins and a loss, yeah. Um, and I saw my pair up for the next day. It was against Necrons with uh, three Doom Scythes, two Triarch Starkers, two Doomsday Arcs, two Tomb Blade Squads, uh, Immortals, Warriors, you know, the whole shebang. And I could tell that he had a really focused list on doing something. And so I asked the, uh, asked the team, you know, what do I do against this? What are my targets? Where am I getting my secondaries? And all those things. And so I went in with a really good game plan of I'm going to do big game hunter, engineers, and old school. And I'm just going to really focus on um, scoring these things, taking out the target priority, and just moving through his list. So luckily, uh, on, number, on, the, on mission number four, it's whoever deploys first goes first. He wins the die roll. I get to deploy first. He doesn't seize. And so now I can uh, fulfill this game plan. Took out a Doom Scythe. Took out a Triarch Stalker. And then was able to just kind of walk through his army through the rest of it. I didn't end up scoring all of my engineers because he got uh, one of his Doom Scythes behind and was able to shoot at my guys because I didn't have a magic box to protect him with. Um, but it was just kind of a really one-sided affair where I ended up winning 31-13 to 13, um, based on just really pushing my objectives and taking his stuff away, taking all of his scoring units away. Mate, quality. So yeah. I think that um, I remember the post, because we've got a private Facebook group for the mentorship guys. I remember you posting in it, and then because there's some other uh, really useful uh, guys in the group that are great tournament players. So you got some good support from them, did you? A good game plan for the next day. Yeah. Yeah, um, they, they actually helped me for that and then the next army, which was the Ultramarines. Cool. So then, talk us through the. So at this point, you're three and one, pretty yep. decent, right? Um, yep. And our goal with the mentorship is to help everyone go three and two. That's always our goal, right? That's kind of mm -hmm. what we set out to achieve at the start. Um, and ultimately, we then want to go beyond that, right? We want to get top ten. Yeah. We want to go winning and that kind of stuff. But the BAO is a different kettle of fish because there are so many people there, right? This isn't a yeah. thirty man event. This is huge. It was 149, I think, was the final count after all the dropouts, but there were over 170 people registered. Yeah, and big names go to that event because there's big points. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Jeff won that event, didn't he? Jeff Robinson. Yep. Um, yep. He's obviously been on Vanguard Tactics. He's a good friend. Um, he's done the Masterclass on GC LeCole. So, yeah, some top... T Brandon Grant was there, right? Um, yep, he took ninth by one point. Yeah, Jim Vessel. So some of these top, top players are there. So even to come remotely close to that is incredible feat. So, yeah, okay. especially since you've only been playing competitively since January as yeah. well. Yeah. In tournaments, yeah. that's absolutely astonishing. That's a fantastic, uh, outstanding work, mate. Really, really pleased for you. I was actually looking on BCP to see what was happening and how everybody finished. And my heart filled with joy when I saw your name and Vanguard Tactics underneath it in 30th position at the end of it. So, uh, yeah. like, uh, I'm so pleased that you uh, you did so well. So then, yeah. talk us through this Ultramarines game. So this was game five, right? <laughs> yeah, this was game five, and um, 
I, I was kind of getting ahead of myself and being like, you know, I, I can I can do this. I'm really good against Marines. I can I can win this. I'm, I'm striking range of getting top eight. Uh, I've got all these great players that I'm around. And so I kind of got ahead of myself going into this game mentally instead of uh, having the tenacity that I had had for the Necron game. Um, I'll, I end up losing at 13 to 26. But what happens is uh, the game plan is uh, play big game hunter, hunters, old school and engineers, shoot off. A, dread, a Dreadnought a turn, uh, get rid of the Leviathan and the Derodeos because those are the things that can deal with my knights, and then just kind of walk through the rest of his list. And we'll probably have an epic battle of the Guillemons in the middle of the table, surrounded by knights who have you know destroyed everything else on the board and move up. So I, I counter deploy to him um, uh, so that everything's out of range of his Leviathan for the first turn. I ended up being out of range of the Leviathan Leviathan for two turns, um, but his Derrida Dreadnoughts with the Laz Cannons were able to target me. And what happened is he goes first, his Derrida Dreadnoughts knock down one of my Crusaders uh, to being pretty low, so it's on its second bracket, but it um, doesn't kill it. Uh, and then nothing else really happens. His indirect fire doesn't do anything to my guys who are on the objective, and I've got everything kind of spaced out. Well, I move my stuff to stay outside of his range of his Leviathan for one more turn, uh, but still be able to shoot back, and I start my shooting, and I'm just rolling horribly. I can't get anything. I've got all of my Guillemot rerolls. I've got everything, and nothing's getting through. I take a Contemptor Dreadnought down to one wound, can't target with anything else left, and a Daredeo Dreadnought down to three wounds. Don't have anything else to target it. So I didn't even I didn't even succeed in in killing anything on the first turn. Let alone, I would roll you know five hits on my battle cannon. He'd roll four four up saves on it, and so it's just like this constant of I can't get enough damage through. He's rolling all the saves. So my dice my dice betrayed me, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I made some mistakes by not having everything in line of sight to finish off one unit. Um, I also m made a couple mistakes on my stratagem usage. And then once once my knight started falling to the Leviathan Dreadnought, I just my, my list fell apart because I just did not have enough firepower to, to return fire and end up killing anything. Um, so I only got five of my secondary points. I did got none of my old school. I nearly got all of my engineers. Uh, and I got two of my big game hunters where I should have gotten at least three, probably four, if the game would have gone more better. <laughs> but it didn't. No. And, uh, yeah, so that was that was one of the, the hard losses. I kind of got, got ahead of myself mentally. I uh, got, got out of my headspace when I was choosing my secondary objectives, and then the dice rolling didn't really, didn't really help it out. So... Uh, so... It sounds like there's plenty to um, uh, revisit from that game to see how you could have done it differently. But it happens that, especially over six games, you're going to have... like It's usually the way it works for me is that I'll have a dud turn of rolling. And it's usually <laughs> the first or third turn for some reason. And then it, it, it it's like the dice remember that it's me and it all and it's okay again after. You know, it comes back. But sometimes the damage is done and you just can't come back for it, you know. Yeah, it happens. Well, yeah. it sounds like you had a, a pretty good game plan, and if the dice had gone better, maybe also if you'd have gone first, it probably uh, might have been a different story as well. Yeah, if I could have, if I could have gone first um, and taken out a, a Derrida Dreadnought or the Leviathan before I can buff it up or anything like that, uh, he loses a lot of firepower, and so it was kind yeah. of a whoever loses firepower first loses the game, and that's what ended up happening. Oh, yeah, I see. So that would have made you three and two at that point, and so you're going yep. to go into game number six. Um, yeah. How did you get on? In, was that your final game, game six? Yeah, it was my final game. Uh, I ended up winning at 32 to 30 against a Tau list, um, and I went into this. I went into the game kind of being like, you know, I don't really care. Tau is really hard for knights to deal with. I don't know if I can do this, but. Um, in the middle of turn one, I kind of like picked up and picked up my tenacity. And I'm like, okay, I can like I can I can win this. I know how to do it. I can beat these Yuvaras. So it was on double Yuvara, double Riptide, all the drones that you can imagine, and then yeah. a couple of marker lights. He had six CP, so he started the game knowing that he wasn't going to use CP for anything. But 
Uh, I figured out very quickly that the Yavaras were not something that I really wanted to charge because of that stupid like 11 inch or 18 inch flamer or whatever it was. Because uh, he was on the set that gives it the extended range. Yeah. And uh, so I just had to kind of walk up really close to him and just shoot him to death. And that's what I did. I just got my knights up into his line, took out all of his drones uh, by splitting, you know, putting my Gatling guns into drones and my heavier weapons into his into his suits so that if the heavier weapons got through, they would kill, you know, deal a lot of damage to him and then just cleared out all the drones so that he would have nothing to pass his wounds off to eventually. Yeah. Um, so we've just had that, a quick, we've had a question here from Chris quickly. Yeah. Before I forget, uh, against the five Dread Ultramarine list, what was the turning point in the fight? He's put in my experience with one Crusader or Castellan and two Hellrins, I can kill one to two Dreads no problem. Was it simply just dice rolls? Was it misdeployment? Was it Lannis up blocking terrain? Um, was it good saves? Um, did he put the strat on to get cover at the start? What was the kind of why was it so hard to take down those dreads? So it was it was dice rolls and saves. I I put two uh, two Gatling guns, a battle cannon, an auto cannon into a contemptor, which should have done it. And one of them was an endless fury. One of them was a, a headsman's mark gun. Like it should have finished that that contemptor dreadnought. But literally on the five, like I got five battle cannons of nine shots through. Uh, he saved four of the five putting it to one wound instead of dead. Um, okay. So so I should have had that kill. And then on the... It was the same thing on the Darrow Darrow Red Knot. I got uh, six, like five or six mortal wounds on my Gatling gun because I had Blast by the Sacrosans on that Gatling gun. And the battle cannon, four of the five... Or four of the six shots got through. The He saved three of the four. And so it's like, you know, if I could just get one through or I could roll not a one on the damage or yeah. and so it was just a lot of things lined up incorrectly. And that's what ended up happening. Oh, nice. No, keep the questions coming, guys, because it's good. Good, all good stuff. So how did that final game finish them before I cut you off? Yeah. Uh, so this was the only game that I got all of my secondaries. I got Big Game Hunter, Recon and Old School. And it kind of came down to this play at the end where my opponent, I had, I had he had destroyed everything. It was Guillemon versus an Ethereal a Fireblade, a Cotter Fireblade, and a Yavara on two wounds left. And um, Guillemon is in his line. I've marched him everything up to the end of the board. All of my knights are dead. My um, Vanguard are kind of just holding the objectives that they can, but mostly dead anyways. I had, I think, one squad left and an Engine Seer. And um, Guillemon goes in, uh, charges the ethereal, doesn't end up killing it somehow, and then he brings all of his guys within three inches of it, shoots him down, and I've got Guillemon sitting here. I have no CP left. On a four plus, I stand back up. He stands back up. My opponent doesn't charge Guillemon. I heroic intervene into his stuff and just kill it all. Oh. And that ends me the game. Because <laughs> he didn't realize that I could heroically intervene. Reese walks by and I'm like, hey, Reese, like my guy just stood back up. He's within three inches. I can intervene, right? And and I did ended up winning the game. So um, yeah, that, and the, and the what reason, a joyful moment for you, guys. Awesome. Yeah. Just a quick one. The um the reason why you can still heroically intervene, or if there is not even a charge declared, is because the charge phase still happens regardless of if you decide to act in it or not. And the wording stipulates that you heroically intervene at the end of the charge phase. So it's just like the movement phase. It's just like the psychic phase. You know, whether you choose to take part in it is up to you or whether you've got the models to do so. So it still happens. And that is why you can heroically intervene. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Amazing, mate. Quality. Yeah. So I was I was glad that I had that had that tactical know how and was like okay if he does this like I've got this one little ace up my sleeve. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, what a beautiful way to end that tournament. Fantastic, yeah. yeah. Nice, so mate. Right. That honestly amazing achievement. Uh, we won't keep you too much longer. Um, okay. But how would you sum up the mentorship program for those that? Because I've had a lot of emails about it that people are thinking, oh, I wouldn't mind signing up to it. What would you say to people if they're sat on the fence? 
uh, the very first thing is it's absolutely worth it. I think I, I would be willing to pay far more than I'm paying right now, but um, I'm, I, I guess I'm paying in both time, mental energy, and money, but I'd be willing to pay more money to get all of the training that I've been receiving, like going from essentially zero to 60 in competitive play, going from being a, a one and two RTT player to a two and one or a three and zero oh RTT player to a four and two at the BAO with a GT lined up next weekend, the Boise Cup uh, lined up in... Uh, the end of June, so two weekends after that, the Slaughter Fest at the end of July after I go to the master class in England uh, in a couple of weeks. Like I've got a ton of stuff lined up, and I've just got both the the inspiration to do it and also the know how, so that I can take all of the all of the resources together and actually put up good results. So, so what what I'm mainly in, in that's like incredible to hear, and obviously there's another exciting announcement that you and I will announce at some point. Yeah. Um, which is, um, or should we do that now? Now, now you're we on. We can. So, no, why not? huge thank you to Brian. Is that um, yourself and your gaming club, um, where you're based, and you have to give everyone the details. And I'll do that through the email chain. Is going to support mm-hmm. me in coming over to compete in the SoCal Open. Yep, we're gonna we're gonna line up a first and second berth so that I can beat Steve in the finals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm so excited for that. So whereabouts are you based in the U.S.? I'm in Utah right now, so just outside of Salt Lake City. Uh, we're we're going to be hosting Steve for about a week or so out here in Utah, doing a, a master class and uh, a clinic on just how to be a better player. And then we'll be headed over to SoCal uh, in Southern California so we can Smash take it. down that tournament. Yeah, mate, I literally can't wait. So if you want to yeah. come to the master class in um end of october isn't it um mm-hmm. we'll put out all the dates on email and everything but if you want to get those details just sign up to www.vanguardtactics.com and we'll put give all the details out in due course and mate i can't thank you enough for um supporting the whole venture for it all happening mate and um it's been an absolute pleasure to i'm so we're so lucky you've joined the mentorship program um yeah yeah like i said i'm so so pleased for you You've done so well. Like it's been, a, it's been a joy to have you um, in the mentorship uh, program and to see that you're getting awesome results and enjoying it. It's absolutely fantastic. It's ex- exactly what we set out to do at the beginning. So I'm so, yeah. so pleased. There's you and a lot of other guys in there um, absolutely killing it. So it's brilliant. And do you know what? You are an absolute credit to us because you work like I've not seen before, okay? I go on our game recordings and you are there. Bang, bang, game, 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 analysis, analysis, analysis. I can see all of your data in, you know, you are reaping the reward. And it's not just the placings, it's not just the wins, but hopefully, like some of the things that you've said, is going to that table with a game plan, with that confidence and saying, hey man, we're gonna have a cracking game, it, let's let the best general win, and I'm gonna bring my A game, and I'm not gonna be anxious or uh, worried about your cheesy list or whatever, you're gonna go, right, we're gonna, we're gonna have a great time, mate. And that is what Warhammer is all about, because you can put the mm-hmm. game to one side, you can have a really good game you know, with your opponent, you know, share a beer, get some food after, whatever it is, and that's what it's all about, right? Um, oh, yeah. but, but knowing that you've got the confidence to go and deliver the goods and be a tactician on the table and to give your opponent the best game that they've ever had is all we can ask for. And then, then you can actually focus on having a good time because it's when you feel inadequate. It's when you feel like, oh, my list is rubbish. Or it's when you feel like, oh, I haven't play tested this enough. I don't know what to do. How am I losing so straight quickly? And, and getting annoyed because you're like, oh, my rolling so bad. Um, and obviously I joke about some bad rolls, but really it is about the, um, you know, you make mistakes on the game, right? And that is what leads to poor performance. And you end up getting so frustrated with the game and so annoyed that, you end up losing the love for it. So all we want to do, guys, is give you the confidence to turn up to the table and love it. So, um, mate, yeah, you're a true ambassador for us, and thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks. What is going to happen now is there's going to be a massive technical hiccup because we've never done this before. <laughs> we've never had anybody actually leave a call. <laughs> so we're going into uncharted territory. So unfortunately, Brian has to go. We're going to try and leave. If this cuts off, We'll be back with part two in a moment, okay? And we, Steve, 
Hand it over to you. Well, actually, <laughs> Brian, voice. Brian, I'm going to ask you to leave and see if that just does it straight away. Okay, okay I'll do it. Here we... Oh. Yeah. Oh, we're still here. We've done it! It, it worked. Oh. <laughs> Nearly fell off my chair. Or anything else, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so guys uh, thanks for the questions we've had uh, Joaquin said I want to be like Brian when I grow up um, <laughs> yeah Chris Wilson's put looking forward to LVO bearing no changes to the meta what are you looking to take to Vegas oh that is good Cresting, good cre question question yeah. Chris um, so we've had I've been chatting away to people in the chat already whilst obviously Brian was on there thank you so much Brian for coming on it was epic so Mark what are you and I going to be talking about for the next half an hour the, well I've got uh, a question right okay. which has got me thinking which is um, which tournament would you really like to go to because me. yeah we're doing all the ones in the UK but then Brian's talking about the uh, the Bay Area Open, like the um, you a lot of good players up there. I like to uh, mix it against the American guys and see if uh, us Brits have uh, got the extra factor, or we're actually rubbish and uh, we should just probably give up or something. And like the Warhammer World GT is, you know, people that are uh, inferior. I don't know. Um, so you got the there's a really great few tournaments in australia there's a, a good one in vancouver i think so you're all forget about the lvo you're already signed up for it where else are you going to go to what's the what what other tournament would you like to go to well i've got serbia i've got the etc yeah. singles that i played yeah. in last year that's a fierce event I can imagine um and they're like four hour rounds as well um that is a really fierce event um and the travelling on that last one just massively took it out of me. I just wasn't mm. physically able to perform that well. Um, and some other sort of business stresses and things got to me. Um, so I want to really give it. Because I had yeah. to actually pull out of, of my last game on the first day there. Yeah. So I was a bit annoyed about that because I had like a real bad migraine sickness. So it is what it is. If you but like, I could give you some health advice for the future. Some training I'd, I'd appreciate stuff. that, mate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Get good sleep. Stay yeah. hydrated and don't yeah. drive uh, 24 hours straight there. Yeah, yeah. Don't drive for two days <laughs> to yeah. Serbia directly. Yeah. yeah, get a it, flight. Especially yeah. in the car with Dan Bates, Manny, and uh, Alex Harrison. That was a, a um, yeah. I I got no sleep. <laughs> Could have imagined sharing a room with those boys and all they do is snore. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, so anyway, that one I'm looking forward to playing in the singles. Um, someone said fantastic, uh, fanatic Sweden, largest 40k tournament. I mean, if someone wants to help me get to Sweden, I'm more than happy to play in the 40k largest tournament there. I'd love to go. That'd be amazing. Adam, hey, it's, drop the it's not so, uh, it, it's not so expensive to go to Sweden. I think like the, uh, well, it's probably expensive when you get there, but the flights, uh, I don't think, uh, that expensive to get there. That is a great call. I would, I would love to go to that one. I think that sounds wonderful. Let's do it. Yeah, okay. Still, mate. When is it? So, Toby745, can you message us the details? And yeah. um, if you are local, help us out with the logistics. Send yeah. a message, an email, whatever, get in touch. I had someone actually get in touch with me today about helping out with the uh, LVO trip. Um, so, yeah. Brian said he's honestly, Brian, who we just had on, has said he's thought about the Sweden, so the Sweden trip. Um, someone said I'm going to a GT in Denmark in a few days. Um, yeah, amazing. All these, all these tournaments. So I've got the Serbia, I've got the LGT, which is obviously going to be huge here in London. Um, and then I've got SoCal Open and then I've got LVO. So I need another big one, another big one to score some big, uh, ITC points. Hmm. So I can smash it, but we'll see. Sounds great. Sounds like a plan. I would love to uh, move over to the states and just play forty k full time. Yeah, the uh, I I would really really like to go to the Bay Area Open um, yeah. next year. The reason being is I've been to um, San Francisco. I've been to the Bay Area. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and then you can have a nice long holiday. Uh, we went to we drove up to Lake Tahoe and spent like four days there last time. It was absolutely amazing. Vegas is good for a weekend, but the California is where it's at. That's what I'm saying. Mm, 
Nice. Well, let's do it, mate. Next year, let's go. Let's get tickets. Yeah, let's get seven. Yeah, let's sounds good. Let's do it. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, or we could always maybe play in the, is it the ATC? The American Team Championships? Maybe rock over there with uh, Vanguard Tactics in, obviously, win. Sounds amazing. Just throwing that out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that sounds good. Um, oh, and there's also the event that you and I are doing in the summer um, up in Newcastle, and I, I'll put some details out about that. So that's soon to be, hopefully, a GT as well. Uh, I think that, that is called, cool. correct me if I'm wrong, that's the majority GT in Newcastle. Yeah, it could be, yeah. Uh, uh, get up the we'll details. details yeah, I'm, I'll yeah, do a... Um, ITC as well. Say that again, mate. I believe that's an ITC tournament also. Yeah, and they're just on the cusp of it coming a GT, I think. So uh, oh, yeah. that would be fantastic if it uh, gets there. Uh, let me get the details up for you very quickly, just as we're on the topic. Cause you and I have got greetings of the warp in two weeks. Um, so that's an ITC event, which we've spoke about before here. And obviously we've then got... Um, yeah. It's the um, Summer Slam GT. That's what it's called. Yeah. The awesome. Summer Slam GT, um, and it is eighty person ITC. Yeah, it's featuring five three hour rounds over two days. So that's that's going to be good. Yeah, um, but I'll post out some details in my email chain as well. So if you guys are interested in the UK going to that event um, in the summer, then uh, me and Mark are going to be there. Um, yeah, come and say hello. Let's get some good games in. So Mark, what are we talking about then? Why right. and what? What's the context behind this? We've got greetings of the warp, and you yeah. were like, "I want to try a new list, right?" Yeah. So the, what we what we're we talking about? Well, what I said was, maybe I should try something new, and then I went, "No, no, I'll stick with Drakari." And you went, "No, you've got to do it. Let's get <laughs> get that credit card out, get some models bought. We can paint them with the airbrush." So, uh, yeah, with the uh, change to um, uh, Asuriani um, psychic powers, not able to work on Drakari, mm -hmm. um, it means that I'm probably better off going mono codex for Drakari. Um, I have purchased uh, some more Talos. I've got a couple of more purchases in the pipeline. I definitely want to run um, mono codex uh, Drakari army. But I have had some custard bikes uh, hanging around for quite some time, so I, I asked you to do me a massive favour and come up with a weekend, bring your airbrush, and uh, help me get them painted so I could utilise them. So I drove and, three hours up to you, didn't I? Yep. Yeah, and then uh, sat there all day and painted your custards for you. You're a true friend. Um, and I think you'd got through most of them in like a couple of hours with the airbrush and straight away I was drawn in by them and I said, I really want to play these. And so you said, well, let's build an arm and take them to greetings. So that was the, uh, uh, that became the plan. So I bought some other units to go with it um, and we uh, did some play testing on Sunday. Yeah, and we played two games on Sunday, didn't we? We, had, we played yeah. two games in four hours. That's how quick we were. Yeah. So, Mark... What was it that we... Um, have you got some questions, by the way, for this? Yeah, so sure, So the, 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 the... Let's talk about... What we want to talk about is going... Is buying another army. Yeah. Getting it on the table. How do you do it? What's the best way? Um, that sort of thing. Because I've seen people doing it, and I've seen people doing it what I think to be the wrong way. Okay? Yeah. Um, and well, I want to try and help people. So that's the that's the context behind it. I think there are two ways to get into the hobby, okay? Yeah. There's two ways to start a new army. Option number one is you read the book, you love it, you love the fluff or you love the models, and you buy what you like, okay? And you put it on the table and you try to do as best as you can. That's cool. But we're not talking about that because that's how we got into the hobby Everyone knows how to do that. You can look at GW's site, look at the models you like and go from there, right? Or, you yeah. know, I've got a bookshelf here of books that I love. You know, I start reading about a Suriman and all of a sudden I've got an Asuraman Diravenger army, right? Easy. What we're talking about is how do you build a new army that is competitive? A balanced competitive army that you could take to a tournament 
and got, you know, like we said, the goal always is to go three and two, four and one, something like that, right? Maybe more if you can, but to yeah. do well with it. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. With and we're talking about not spending Mark jokes about getting his credit card out, but there's a difference between buying a art, uh, buying the models for the list that you need versus buying models for the sake of buying models, right? So we want like efficiency with our credit card because we don't have endless amounts of cash, unfortunately. So we want to make sure that the, the money is being put to good use. And also, we don't want to have endless amount of time because you've got to get them painted. If you're going to take them to a tournament, they've got to have minimum three colours and everybody likes it to look smart. You know, a lot of people take a lot of pride in it. Yeah, no, exactly, yeah. Yeah. So let's uh, let's talk about the before you've bought a single model. The what are some of the things that you can do to try and figure out what's going to be good for you? Um. So yeah, the I think the starting point for any new army in like recently because of the channel, I've played. What well, I've played so many armies, haven't I? Recently. Sure. Uh, Chaos. Uh, recently. Yeah, in the last kind of um, six months, I've played Death Watch, um, Eldar, Harlequins, Admech, and um, New Yen New New Yenari, Yenari. Yenari yeah. and also now Chaos. And I've yeah. had a dabble with Slanesh as well. So, um, you know, it is becoming more and more increasingly difficult um, to pick my favourite. That's basically what I'm saying. But I think the, the most important thing is just you need to identify a play style that you like, right? So, and that could be something completely different to what you've ever played before. If you want a new challenge, do you want an army that is durable? Do you want an army that packs a punch? Do you want an army that takes a lot of skill? Do you want an army that is more of a gun line? Do you want an army like Brian's, which is minimal um, fatigue in terms of model mm -hmm. moving um, and it's more about positioning and threat ranges and stuff like that and there is skill in every army by the way if if um, I would argue to the teeth to anyone that thinks an army is an auto win there is skill behind every single list that is played at the top level but yeah so I think the first thing is identify a style of list that you want to play um, and then you need to just open that book. And the first thing that I would do with this is look at, first of all, the thing you want to do is look at the overall army abilities. Okay, so you're looking at either, let's pick, uh, let's pick Chaos Legions, okay? So you're going to look at Alpha Legion, Black Legion, you're going to look at all those abilities. What do they do? What is attracting you to that army? Okay. And a lot of the hidden gems in most books are within the stratagem specific legions or chapters, right? That's where the gems are. The, the things that make it so unique to that army, okay? And then from that point, you can start to look at warlord traits and relics. And here what I would do is get yourself a sheet and start to write down any key overlapping abilities, all right, and, I'm, and I'll happily talk you through my chaos list before we go to greetings of the warp. I'm sure there'll be some people that will know. I don't mind talking through my list. Um, but yeah, essentially, you look for those overlapping fields of buffs, auras, abilities that strengthen a particular field. Um, and then what you do is you build around it. You make that your focus and you let that work and do the trick, right? So should we take your custodes, for example? Sure. What did we find to be extremely effective in the codex? Um, bikes. Bikes, great, durable, hit hard, put put out a lot of firepower. They can. And the thing is, once you've once you've identified those elements, we then need to start to think: Can you beat certain things? Can you beat three knights? Can you beat a hundred orcs? Can you beat you know one hundred and twenty gene stealers? Can you um, clear off chaff from guard in touch tanks, for example? Right. Can you shut down psychic ability? So you need to have all these elements in the list. Yeah. So the bikes are fantastic. They can do a lot of the horde clearance. But yet looking through the book as well, we can start to see that the gravit the Kaladus Gravis tank, 
Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. In the beta rules um, that have just come out, yeah. Very good for his points. Mm. Puts out a lot of shots. Um, and the gun that you choose is the cheapest one. It's not the best gun, I would say, but it's the cheapest one. You keep them cheap, you keep them reliable, and they just put out a lot of shots. So if one's good, in the, the first game that we tested, we tested one versus the Telemann, didn't we? We did, yeah. To see which one stacks up better. And we found that the fire output from the Gravis tank is superior to the Telemann. Okay? Yeah, especially because the, what we found was that the, the Telemann needs to be static to be effective. Because the event, it doesn't have power in the machine spirit, so it was getting a minus one to hit, and it was really evident that that was, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, problematic against the tank which had power in the machine spirit, um, and was getting a reroll from the uh, uh, warlord. So yeah, that was a, uh, um, and we used, uh, we didn't have any graph tanks, uh, mm-hmm. obviously, because the, you get them from Forge World and the, they're eighty five pounds each. So we didn't have a Telemann either, did we? No, uh, so we we just proxied so. Uh, that would be my advice to everybody is before you buy a single model, proxy a couple of games because what you think might work. So if you've taken Steve's approach and I used this approach, uh, I remember the last time I went on holiday this year and I took the Space Wolves Codex with me and I went through, I had a little book and I went through every single entry in the Space Wolves Codex and studied the, each of the things that uh, it could do um, and thought about what would be the battlefield role of that unit, and then I got to the warlord traits, and I got to the relics, and I got to the um, uh, stratagems, and I, I was writing down: could this work with this? Could this? Yeah. How how would I do this? How would I do that sort of thing? And I built space wolves lifts, um, dependent upon uh, going through that. Now I've been running space wolves for a long time, so, you, so I already had some models. Because you actually wanted to use telemans, didn't you? It is, yeah. Because you said to me you love the models, and I said this isn't yeah. about loving the models. This is about bringing a competitive list as quickly as we can to the table. So we tested it. The Telemann's more durable, granted, but the Gravis tank packs out more of a punch, and it's cheaper. We're playing 1750, so normally you have to shave off some points here and there. So rather than taking triple Telemann, we can take triple um grav tanks because they're cheaper and still have a very similar battlefield role and also what we're then able to do is look at what mark has had success with in the past three ravages and we've replaced them so rather than three ravages and an archon that gives reroll hits of one to hit and wound um, and get cps back we've basically manipulated that to be the same with the custos right but with some yeah. different elements so now we've got fast moving grav tanks with uh, Trajan Valoris that gives reroll hits of one, reroll hits of one to wound. Amazing. So that's absolutely fantastic. So now all of a sudden we're capitalizing on what Mark's already good at in the game. He can read the game that way um, and then bring in these three. It's like the cornerstone of the army, right? Um, so then that's great. Mark's in familiar territories. No has going to use this. So then how do we then make this even better? And we used a repulsor, didn't we? A repulsor tank and we used yeah, a, yeah. a Leviathan Dreadnought as a Telemann to test it. Um, so if you are going to test it, look, get a land raider. Just go, yeah, that's this, that's this. Tell your opponent. And the other really important thing here was that me and Mark had a dialogue before the game. What is the purpose of this game? This is about seeing and building the best custode list we can in the shortest period of time. So that means if I go first and table the Telemann in, in the first turn, we'll re-rack it game three, and then you'll go again and I'll, in, I'll intentionally target the grav tank so we can see the damage output of this stuff. Okay, So I'm not there getting salty because, for whatever reason, um, Mark doesn't get new model syndrome because we're testing this thing out. We're getting many reps in with the same list, right? Um, yeah, and, yeah, I, sure. and I was saying, Mark, you get five minutes to deploy. You get ten minutes for your first turn. Um, and just on this very quickly, because I know I'm going to forget, guys. On the 6th of July, the 6th of July, Vang up myself and the team, so Mark and Jack and Dan, we're going to be running a coaching day. And this is a masterclass of Vanguard Tactics. This is... I've never seen or heard of anything like this being done before. Um, So it's a concept I took from my fitness business, and we're applying it to 40K, basically. You're going to come and spend the day with me, Mark, Jack, and Dan. Um, We're going to have four tables there. 
all beautifully terrained, game at EU tables, absolutely everything. And I've done the format of today. And essentially the format is going to be over the course of that day, you're going to get three lessons of 45 minutes to an hour of tactics. And we're going to show you deployments, tricks you can do. We're going to go through each of the phases of the game. And you're then going to play three games in that day as well against different opponents. Now, the guys on our mentorship get first dibs and then any spots left over. So we're going to have eight spots in total. That is it. And I think four to five will go for our mentorship. So if you're interested in coming to this day, it's going to be held in Market Harbour in Leicester. There's, we're going to send out all the details of like, you'll get your food provided as well, won't they? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. We'll send out all the details for hotel accommodation, all this good stuff. So if you want to come, I'm going to put tickets on sale because I don't, I'm waiting for the mentorship guys to say how many tickets they want. But after that, on Sunday morning at 8 a.m. Uh, British summer time, I'm going to put out the, the tickets at, via our email, www.vanguardtactics.com. And I'm going to, you know, put out the details to buy those three tickets. OK, so if you want to come get there, it's going to be a day like no other. Um, probably go out for some food in the evening or something. Won't we make an evening? Yeah, absolutely. Well. Yeah, yeah, have a couple of beers and stuff. Yeah. Um, and essentially what I want to do is if this goes well, I want to do more dates and I want to tour around the US doing this same thing. So um, there's loads of exciting stuff that we're going to be doing. So that is the 6th of July, guys, in basically a month today. So let's keep the date free. There'll be three to four places available. I, I can hopefully, I think they'll be gone pretty quickly uh, from the interest we've had so far. The price is literally going to cover the hall cost, um, a bit of our you know expenses like petrol and stuff like that, food, and that's about it. So it's not going to be much. We're looking to, uh, it's not profit related. We're not trying to make a stack of money. We're just trying to see if this works, if there's interest for it. We think it's like a bit of a succinct um, introduction to mentorship, um, and we did, we have never heard of anything like this before. In so one to one. So there's four tables because there's four of us. So and you'll move around, and ev you'll you, everybody you'll see all the guys. You go through all the phases. It's not about winning. It's about learning loads. Imagine going to a tournament where you had somebody in your ear going, "No, don't move that there." Don't shoot this. Don't do this. You know, but that or you well done. That's a that's a great thing. And make some notes and take it with you. Take it to your next tournament. Buy a list off us or whatever, or we'll look at your list on the day and then smash it. You know, mm -hmm. if you if you're losing four games and winning one, let's see if we can get you to three and two. You know, or if you if you're doing all right, let's see if we can get you to four and one. You know, get you in that top ten of, of your next tournament. And the other thing I will give as well, I'll give you a month's access. To the mentorship so if you sign up on sunday you get a month's access to the mentorship program up until sunday so we can rearrange so you can arrange like accommodation with some of the guys and all that stuff you can get to know the rest of the team that we've got so obviously all private on facebook so you get to know all that get to introduce some really cool guys and hopefully you know you'll join the mentorship program after anyway because you'll see um, what it's all about and it's all about community we're gonna have such a great time a really good laugh and um yeah play some good 40k in the real critical thing is about the thinking the analysis like mark said you know i'm gonna be there questioning you what is your opponent thinking right now what would you do in their shoes how do you stop them from doing what they need to do and then I'll analyze point by point what it is you need to do in order to be successful to go forward in this turn so it's going to be great. So game one, Mark, um, yeah. let's go through our first test game. I was running my chaos list. I've yeah. made some alterations to it already because one massive thing happened in our game and I've already fixed that problem. Um, but I was running my chaos list. You were running the custodes. Uh, game one, you ran the Telemann, you ran the Gravis tank, and you ran some three units of bikes, didn't you? I did, yeah. And then um, a Loyal 32 as well Yeah. Uh, with a couple of HQs. So let's go through the game. You pick sides. So then I can basically, because you pick sides, I can decide who goes first, essentially, yeah. later down the line. And I made you go first, didn't I? Because did, I, yeah. I deployed out of, out of range and out of line of sight. Um, now, the way my army works is very tricksy. Um, it's not your standard chaos build. It's very quick um, and very, very different to what most people are running at the moment. So um, it'd be quite exciting to see how this does at a tournament. But... 
Um, the first thing that you did, your bikes, what did you do? I pushed them up the board towards you um, and tried to shoot you and then prepared to charge you. Yeah, and what happened? They died. <laughs> well, the thing is, you put six bikes in my face. Yeah. You shot a unit, you got your kill, didn't you? You got your first strike, which is what yeah. you needed to do. But you did that with just the Telemann and the Grav Tank alone, didn't you? And you then put six bikes in my face, and then you move, move, moved two units onto the objectives to get yourself holding, potentially hold more. I then do a pretty fancy, or I basically just chuck everything at those um, six bikes, don't I? I shoot you, shoot you twice, and then I put my Demon Prince and my Chain Lord in combat with you, and then that's six bikes down, isn't it? Yeah, the Chain Lord did a lot of damage. Uh, it was yeah. pretty important. Yeah, I think it took... Took out two bikes, um, and one that was left on one wound or something like that. Yeah. So um, that was pretty devastating. Um, and then from that point, from you then, you then struggled to reclaim the board, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a custodes are a Spartan list. So each model you've got in your army is a H, like a HQ. Um, and if they're gone, there's not a lot left. Um, so I had some tanks, I had uh, Trajan Valoris, and I was looking at it and going, this is does not look good. I can't get board presents. I've got some Loyal 32, but they're, most of those have been mutilated in uh, by turn two. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was struggling by that point. Um, but I understood what was what worked well and what didn't. You know, like the straight away, let's look at that for turn three. The bikes were great. But I sacrificed them. I understood that. should have held them back. The Telemon was useful, but when I needed to move it, and every time it moved, it struggled. Yeah. The Grav Tank was exceptional, did work, did good work, um, and moved successfully. Uh, the Loyal 32 did move, 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 did good stuff, but unfortunately, because uh, I couldn't control the board because I didn't have the bikes to do it, I was struggling and they just died. Yeah. So. It wasn't that they were poor, obviously, because you know they aren't they aren't poor. And you did but it was tactics. You know what I mean? I, I had uh, the wrong yeah. tactics. You did a really good job, but the the thing that let you down was that at turn four, I well, at the end of turn three, I looked at the points and I was like, I can pretty much dictate from which point what what secondary you score, mm. what primary you score. I don't have anything to really kill your tanks or Telemann left in my army. But that's okay, because I don't need to. All I need to do is I've got board control. I'm just going to keep it. I'm just going to score my secondaries that I need to do, because they are relied on me, not killing you. Um, and that's what I focused on. And I just basically hid my characters, because you had head Hent Hunter with the Vindicare. Um, and I basically just, yeah, admitted... Oh, what, what would be the best analogy? I didn't try and kill you. I just ran away from you, essentially. Yeah. I hid, because that's all I needed to do to win the game. It's not like, you know, 40k isn't about who tables their opponent. It's about who scores the most points. So that's exactly what I focused on. So then in game two, we re-racked, didn't we? We changed the list up. Yeah. And the reason why, when Mark says the Telemann needs to be moving, he doesn't actually need to move. The reason why it needs to move as a block is because Trajan Valoris is an absolute beast. And you want him moving. You want him in the centre of the field. You want him just smashing things out of the park. So otherwise... Well, it's very know. similar to what uh, Brian described his list. So he moves three knights up with Gilliman behind it. Well, you move your tanks up with Trajan behind it. And then somebody's going to attack him. He pops out and says, I'm useful. Um, I, I've got you know, I've got plenty of attacks at strength 10 yeah. with flat three damage. <laughs> I am. Uh, I can fight twice on a stratagem. Um, I can fight twice on the moment shackle. Um, you know, uh, he is uh, super for 185 points. Really is. Oh, he's amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good tactic. So then we changed the list up. We dropped a unit of bikes, didn't we? We had. Um, two units of bikes. We went for three grav tanks, and they went for how do we make these guys more durable? We make them minus one to hit. Now you've got a real tasty list. Um, and this time um, we sweat. We what went? Did I go first in this game? 
I did. I, yeah, I, I asked first. You if you would go first, as a so I could try. I could try and go second and see uh, yeah. how it go. Because your list is built to go second, as is mine. Um, so I was like, okay, cool. I'll go first. Um, and yeah. Oh, uh, Chris Smalley's just made a comment. I'm useful. In, in quotation marks. Hope the Black Library writers can put that into a custodes book. <laughs> Hello there, I'm Trajan. I'm useful. Yeah. Pick me. Yeah. I've, been, I've been known to, to do a bit of damage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, there was a key moment in the game, wasn't it, uh, that you and I played. Um, and this is basically 40k. Yeah. The element of the dice... As we know, guys, I sometimes don't have the best luck when it comes to key moments, okay? So my chain lord needed to double move, didn't he? I surrounded your grav tanks. I did quite well. I moved my bikes. My bikes were doing some good work for me on the edge, and I then got them into double tap range on one of your grav tanks. My blitz came down, and a double shot, and you just were making saves like I w couldn't believe and then I reminded you that your grand strategist gives you a re-roll and you could CP re-roll another dice so you can technically yeah. re-roll two different dice which would save you from dying. I hate myself sometimes. But anyway, you had these grab tanks there. Both were pretty, you know, on their last legs. And then I thought, right, Chain Lord jumps over. He kills the third. So in one turn, I kill three tanks. It'd be amazing, right? And then I can protect Chain Lord. Happy days. What happened? I rolled a one and a two on um, warp time. Rerolled the one, rolled another one. So warp time was not happening. My whole army was up the field. This simple mistake that I made was that I left my chain lord vulnerable. Because at the time I was like, ah, oh, make that warp time easy. I've got to reroll for it anyway in the back. He can't vec me like these days. Um, so <laughs> then you capitalized on it. You saw the biggest threat to me, and that was kill the chain lord. And all the time, um, you just. You positioned your bikes lovely, they came down, um, and there was like another unit wasn't there that was blocking you. And do you yes. remember, I was like, Mark, how do you kill the chain lord? And you were like, well, I can't. I was like, yes, you can. What do you need to do? And you were like, I need to kill the chain lord. Yes, I know. What do you need to do? And you were like, okay, these Alpha Legion guys are stopping me. I was like, yes, yeah, so... And then it's like the penny drop. You're like, oh, kill them. Yes. And then you yeah. just wipe the chain lord off the board then with some other shots because he was now the closest enemy unit. Yeah, and I and that that's a um, uh, to give some context to that. So you imagine that the, the you've got two halves of the board. All right, one half of the board I've got three grav tanks and Trajan Valoris. And what has happened is that Steve has placed his entire shooting array of that chaos army, um, the obliterators, the bikes, the um, terminators. Uh, terminators so everything that you've got and then you double shot and uh you know that was the point at which that we were making saves and that sort of thing so in front of um those tanks and trajan is the horrors of his army you know and that's a hell of a lot of shots and really potent as well so yeah. you wouldn't blame anybody for saying right i'm going to concentrate on this area and clear all these off and i did think about dropping the bikes into that area to assist them to get rid of them all and then move them up the board. But I looked at the board, I saw an opportunity, I thought, right, I can bring one set of bikes down at one area, one set of bikes at the other, target those two characters. I picked Headhunter as a secondary as well, so it would have got me two points. The Chain Lord is horrendous in combat uh, because of the way it's built, and it can easily take, you know, 10, 12 wounds um, from uh, either individuals or multiple, you know, uh, tanks, whatever it is, because it's heavy on mortal wounds. So I looked at that situation, and I was prepared to use those tanks to get rid of the bikes or the uh, obliterators, and that's when sort of Steve guided me and said, look, just use them, use the grav tanks, and get rid of these cultists, you know what I mean? Like the uh, the nothing, nothing guys, but they're blocking you from being able to target the character, and that was the basically the, the key to it. Once they'd gone... I had a good strategy anyway. I had the Vindicare, I had the tanks, I had Trajan. I used, I, oh, you had the Demon Prince there as well. So I managed to get rid of most of the bikes. Get, uh, I left the Obliterators alone. Yeah. Um, fought the Demon Prince in combat. Shot the uh, troops around it. Attacked both of the um, uh, HQs. Uh, the Sorcerer as well, I think. 
with the bikes, um, managed to get rid of uh, uh, the chain load. I'd already taken a few wounds off him, I think, with the Vindicare. And, so then, left. and then because we deployed your guys in such a way you were then able to um charge weren't you with the bikes and you just yeah. literally in a turn you took my shortcoming and mistake that happens in 40k you capitalized on and you won the game and that just shows now that you're able to look at a situation and go aha i need to capitalize on that mm. this is what i now need to do the game plan needs to slightly change or i've given you a game plan which is kill a character kill two characters or whatever so no, mate, you played really well. And the thing that we did, a lot of the time throughout the game, I was asking you, what do I need to do? Stop me doing it. What do yeah. I, what am I thinking of doing? And you were like, well, you, I'd probably do this. Exactly, stop me doing it then. And then you'd, yeah. you, you'd score those points. So that yeah. was amazing. But the other thing that we did, guys, as well, so we proxied all the models. Uh, we, we wrote the list. We had a couple of variations, okay? We proxied the models. Um, we tested it. Um, we had, you know, I went first, you went first. We used a standard map, so there was good terrain and stuff. Um, we, you know, I put up a, a decent list up against you. We had that dialogue even before we played. We knew the outcome. That was to test your list as best we could. I'm trying to help you play it better. I, I couldn't care if I won or lost. You know, I'm just trying to help you, uh, you know, w it's, it's like a team effort, right? We want to make a quality yeah, custode yeah. list. Well, um, that's uh, that's an important point actually. So before we set off to go down to the, because uh, it was my local club who opened up for the day on a Sunday. You know, they have all day gaming, so we had plenty of space there. And uh, you were saying, you know, uh, what do you want to get from this? I said, actually, the best thing I can do is lose because it'll show the weaknesses of this list. Yeah. Um. So I'm totally couldn't care less about winning. That wasn't what it was about. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can all get a little bit. F f fixated on trying to win where you actually want to win is uh in the tournament you know um that if you i remember listening to tom Layton talk about this because i think tom finished third at the london gt last year with yanari uh, i think he said he'd had about four or five games and lost them all beforehand but it was different different combos and that sort of thing and then he's won like five out of five or whatever you know mm -hmm. yeah that's it you want to lose basically my girlfriend Amy always asked me, "Oh, how do you get on?" I'm like, "Well, I want to lose today." Yeah. Because I'll learn, I'll learn something if I lose. Um, so Chris Smalley has said, "Is part of list writing knowing your risky plays are uh, and simulating scenarios?" Yeah, exactly. I.e., mm -hmm. warp time, death hex uh, being pivotal spells and mitigating the risk factor and putting the roles in your favour. Yeah, so that's exactly like again on the mentorship, we teach people look where do you need your CPs. And if you need a CP reroll, like that's a key moment. You know, I don't encourage people just to use CP rerolls for the sake of it, or a stratagem for the sake of it. Um, it is about do you need to do that? Just because you can do it, just because Trajan could fight again, doesn't mean he should do it. Um, because if you've already killed something that turn, if you've already got the kill more, it's a waste. Yeah. So that's what you've got to constantly think about. Um, so yeah, you need to make sure you're trying to mitigate these risky elements as much as you possibly can. Um, so Chris has said, hi, Magister trait, plus one to cast. Yeah, so the reason why I've adapted my list already is because I'm now taking Araman because he gets plus one to cast. Mm -hmm. So that just helps me cast walk time because I need it. I need prescience for my list to work. I need walk time for my list to work. Um, so yeah. Um, and I've already written down the CPs I'm spending even before, because in my list of 1750, I've got nine CPs. I know exactly where every single one of those CPs is going. So there's no decision fatigue. Um, I just turn up, cool, play this, play that. Do, 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 do. Happy days, play the consistent game. And now you've gone out and bought the grab tanks, haven't you? I have, yes. But we put them through some rigorous testing, so now yeah. you know when you build and paint them, you know they're going to be reliable. You're not going to get, oh, this model's rubbish and whatever. No, yeah, it's going to be great. You're going to, you're going to love it. I, th I think that the uh, I see so many people uh, in various Facebook groups going, hey, I've bought these. Like, um, there may be, they're not so, those guys aren't competitive. They've got like a group of friends that play together. And if that's what you want to do and you love the models, then that's awesome. You know what I mean? I'm not knocking you for a second. But this... We're 
here because we're competitive. We're talking about this on YouTube because we're competitive. We're trying to help people be more competitive and, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, have better tournaments, win games against the mates and that sort of thing. Yeah. So what we're saying is, if you're going to get a new army, don't do that. Play some games, proxy it, go through the codex. Um, look at those combinations, how it's all going to work together. The relics, the warlord traits, the psychic, the stratagems, the what units, what's redundancy on those units, you know. Uh, ask yourself, can this list beat uh, Brian's list with yeah. the three knights? Could it beat 150 orcs, you know? How would it fare against it? Yeah. Um, does it beat Tau, you know? Does it beat a gun line? Is it weak? What's this? How do I play differently, you know? And then it's great if you've got, like I've got, very lucky to have Steve who said, yeah, let's play as many games as possible. You don't have to get past turn two if you don't want. You go, oh, hang on. Let, uh, re re-rack. Yeah, re right Go again. Try something different or change the situation. Put a unit back on the board. Deploy differently, you know, that sort of thing. So the um, I asked you if you wouldn't mind going first in the second game. And you said, well, I've deployed to go second. Do you mind if I change? I went, no, of course you can. Change whatever you want. Yeah. Even though I've put my stuff down, I don't care. What, mm-hmm. What's the what's the point in being salty yeah. about it? Oh, no, you can't do that. Well, no, I need the, the most Practice. potent test possible. Yeah. So, yeah, um, have the best deployment you possibly can because that will yeah. test my list well. And then, then buy the stuff and then... So, if, you've had a really good question, Mark, in the chat. Would you do that from uh, Kay Garten? Uh, would you, and thanks for the question, mate. Keep them coming, guys. These are all great questions. Would you do that anyway for your first army? If you could, it'd be fantastic. But I, I think that you've probably already started by the time you found us and listened to this. But if you yeah. haven't, if you're just loving, and do you know what is amazing, mate? Um, I sent out an email yesterday on our email list, um, and I, you know, I'm going to start doing weekly emails. I'm, I'm going to get back to doing it, um, and I called it story time with Steve. You know, little lessons that I'm learning from the games and things. Um, and I said, guys, look, email me back if you like this content. And I, and do you know what? It was. I opened up my inbox today, and it was like, and people just saying, oh, "I've just found 40k because of your your videos." So look, if you're watching, and you maybe used to play when you were younger, and you're thinking about getting a first army, go and buy three different codexes. Read all three, see which one you like, um, and then literally do what we're doing. Ask someone. You know, that, you know, you know that plays 40k, and then say, look, can I borrow your army? Okay, I'm going to use, you know, I'm using Death Guard Marines as Chaos Marines, okay? I'm using Pox Walkers as Cultists, okay? Um, I was using Death Watch Bikes as Chaos Bikes until I got my new ones, you know? It doesn't matter. They're the same size on the same size base. It's clear what they are as long as I tell you. With a bit of imagination, we're good to go. This isn't like you know, three colour minimum and you've got to have exactly WYSIWYG models. It's not about that. It's about creating an army. You just need to find someone cool enough to do it with, okay? Um, there seems to be a real big divide in the in, in the gaming community of like your sort of narrative players that like everything to be um, painted and WYSIWYG and, and, and look, if you love that, great, okay? But there's also a part to be competitive because you know, if there's a unit that you really like the look of and you would love to paint, but you want to see, is it playable, proxy it first and then yeah. paint it up to that WYSIWYG model, right? Amazing. Um, but also understand that there's an element of competitive. And if you are a competitive player as well, you know, take a bit of pride in your hobby. Once you know this is working, I like this, I've play tested it, put a bit of time and effort into painting it, you know? So... There, there's no right or wrong way. This is where we kind of sit in the middle. We want to help people that are club players become the best 40k players that they can be and help you feel confident when you go to the gaming table. So, yeah, if you're going to start an army, use the same tactics that we're telling you. Nothing wrong with that. Um, to, to Just to extrapolate on the answer for that question, I think that, that um, if, if, you, if you start in your first army, then I think that's, the, that's a, a great way to do it because of the cost investment, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's maybe for somebody, so if you were playing in 7th and you have sold an army or whatever because you moved house or, you know, like the this sort of thing, and you've gone, ah, oh, really, or 6th edition, and you were getting back into it, and you've gone, right, I'm going to I'm gonna buy some 
forces you know what i mean then yeah that's a great way to do it but if you're brand new to it then the um just start small one of the pieces of advice i'd give you is the uh net listing can be worthwhile and the, but from a certain perspective we were looking you and i uh, uh jeff robinson's list that he won the um uh bay uh bay area open with yeah and we were talking about how we thought he played it and we weren't certain you know and if i was to take jeff's list i wouldn't have anywhere near the success that, that jeff had had with it whatsoever um he's obviously played uh custodes for a long long time and been extraordinarily good at it but what you can ask yourself about that list is what's the combos that he's using see if you can figure it out you know what i mean going through the codex and saying yeah you know if you if you look at uh the any faction that you're interested in what are people using or what are common things and if you look in the codex you'll go yeah that's pretty strong you know what i mean like the if the lists were available on the bcp for like the top um you yeah. know, hunt it's, players. It's, Take all the custodes players if you're a custode player and have a look and see what combo, see what people are using, see who was successful and go, Well that looks good as a combo and see what psychic powers they've got. Check the book, all the rest of it. On that note, the other thing that I've started doing is I'm gonna do a bi weekly feature of power combos on our YouTube channel. Yeah. So subscribe guys. Recently I did it on Admech, three top power combos of Admech. Um, I'm going to do more. So you, these are little plugins that you could do into your force. So give that a listen. Buy those units. Take that relic. Take that warlord trait. Take that legion or whatever. Plug it in. It might be 600 points of stuff, but plug it in your army. It's powerful. It's potent. It does a job. It's competitive. Um, and you know, I'm not going to cover them all in one video. I'm going to do maybe a couple. Maybe th like I said, three. Um, and over on our Patreon, we do better the meta. Uh, so basically, on our Patreon, if you subscribe on our, like, f I think $5 tier, um, which is basically like £3 if you're in the UK, we do a better than meta every single month where I basically talk over how to beat an army, okay? I go over the army, what it does, what it's weak against, and how to beat it. Number two, the other thing I talk about is the list that I'm creating. So I don't just go over, here's my list, I talk you through how I play it the ideas behind it, every single intricate little thing, how I'm going to deploy it, what I'm going to do turn by turn. It's not just a, here's my list, have a look at it. Um, the next thing that we also do is we stream a live game, and you guys choose the armies that we play. So last month it was Blood Angels. I said, guys, what do you want us to play? Um, I'm going to use the Chaos. Who do you want me to play the Chaos? And they all voted Blood Angels. So we had Blood Angels versus Chaos on the stream. Um, and then the fourth piece as well is a strategic video it's where I go over a phase in the game and I go over and deliver it into some detail where you can really understand all and that's just for the, the for the patreon on top of all the content that we're doing here so um, guys we'll just wrap this up mark couple of things if you want to go be a patreon subscriber um, you can either head over to patreon or through our email list www.vanguardtactics.com and you sent all the links there um, to get that better the meta the list every month so those four pieces of key content that we do um, you know subscribe to here and you'll get vts these ask live shows every other week uh, we do a battle report averaging about once a month at the moment just because they're so they take so much time we want to increase that but the other thing is, well, the more help and support we get, the more frequency we can get those up to as well, right? Um, and then the other thing that we're going to do is those power combos on here. Um, if you sub subscribe to my emails, I'll email you every week with what I'm learning, lessons learned, some top tips from that side of things. Uh, we've got one space available on our mentorship program, okay? And you can get that from Patreon at the moment. That's one space available on the mentorship program, like Brian's been on to chatting, some of the guys in the chat you've been talking to on that mentorship one space available for that um, and and there's loads of cool things that like every month you unlock something different um, and then finally uh, there's going to be if you if you've just joined on the 6th of June then sorry 6th of July in one month's time we're going to be hosting the first ever coaching masterclass to hit 40k so we're going to teach you all day how to play 40k you're going to play three competitive games like me and mark just spoke about and the sales for those three to four tickets there's not going to be many because our mentorship guy is going to be coming um is going to go on sale on sunday morning at 8 a.m i'm going to send out an email and it's going to be first come first serve it's going to be near leicester in the uk 
um, that will give all the details about accommodation and I'm also going to give you a month's free access to the mentorship anyway okay so if you're interested in coming to that um, that would be great and if you're interested if the place goes in the mentorship and you still want to come or you want to get a place on that maybe we could do a waiting list or something and we get another mentorship program up together but only if the interest is there um, someone said a power combo for Harlequins would be great David love it I love Harlequins I'll do a power combo for Harleys next time Anything else you want to finish up with, Mark? I think uh, it's been a great show. Really, I really, I can't go, I can't tell you how pleased I am for for Brian um, to be part of his success story. That's made me incredibly happy because this is exactly what we set out to do. Was uh, as we say constantly, any money that comes our way ends up buying models, terrain, board, travelling tickets to tournaments not uh, we're constantly putting money in ourselves not a penny's been made for anybody yet and it, you know that uh, we're a long way from doing anything like that we do this because we really enjoy it we're creating content for the community and hopefully uh, yeah. it's landing it's helpful people enjoy it you know um and all the things that you talked about there including the battle reports and that sort of thing so i'm really really pleased that uh you know, we've managed to help somebody, an awesome person on their journey. So, and guys, you know, for everyone that's emailed me to, you know, um, say they love the channel, when I posted the power combos in the AdMech 40k group on Facebook, I had loads of people saying they love uh, our video. So, guys, we can't thank you enough for all that support. It means the absolute world to us, and it's why we do it, right? Yeah, it's awesome. Thank you. Like Mark said, it, it doesn't make money. We reinvest everything. Like we had to go and get a new Space Marine army. I've had to buy more terrain. I've already got. We you know we've got one table, but we need more. So it all needs to get reinvested. Um, yeah. So anyway, guys, we'll leave it there. Um, do subscribe, and uh, we'll see you all soon in two weeks' time for another Ask VT at seven thirty British Summer Time on the what's the two weeks two weeks away from now? Uh, the twentieth. June 20th, we'll be back for another Ask BT. Get it in the diary. Yep. See you then. See you then, guys. Thanks a lot. See you later.